Hello, I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks by Maybank. In this second episode of our C-Suite Talk series, Tan Sri Sharil Ritza Ritzwan, one of the brightest minds in corporate Malaysia, discusses leadership and innovation. He is currently chairman of ASEATA and was managing director of Kazana National and CEO of EPF. Speaking to him is Datuk Fadil Muhammad, the CEO of Maybank Investment Bank. Thank you, Sharil, for being with us. Having known you some 20 over years, when you were a lawyer at Danaharta, I have watched you propel into various leadership roles, including at MRCB, EPF, and Kazana. What would you say is that one core value that leaders must embrace? Uh, for me, I think, uh, especially if uh, you're going to be a leader across different organizations or industries, the main thing which I found has been very useful for me um, has been the fact that I've always been willing to learn and to adapt. Um, and I think that sense of adaptability uh, to circumstances and especially as markets shift around you um, is uh, very important for a leader, especially today. When you think about how leaders respond uh, to the world and how it moves around them, and their own longevity as leaders uh, is it really that ability to shift, adapt, and to learn um, all the time. Um, and I think that's one of the key things, uh, which I think has been very, very useful. Uh, and as a subset of that, I think the other thing which I found has been useful in my own uh, leadership journey really has been uh, an ability to communicate clearly uh, with the people around me, uh, both in terms, of, I think, of uh, what the expectations are, right? In terms of basically the organization's vision or its values, um, and also being able to very clearly respond to them uh, in terms of their own problems um, and encouraging, I think, uh, an honest debate, an honest discussion around me. From where I sit, Maybank, as I've always said, is a very institutionalized organization. And institutionalization takes time. A lot of it is embedded by the culture that leaders bring to the organization. You have witnessed corporate Malaysia evolve from entrepreneur-driven companies to becoming institutionalized. Where do you think we are in our corporate evolution? I think uh, just like most markets, right, you do need to have a good mix of both entrepreneur-driven organizations uh, because they tend to be much better at both responding to the market in terms of basically of uh, at innovation, uh, creating new products and services, and also organizations which are more institutional, uh, providing stability. Uh, towards basically their core businesses and the markets that they operate in. Um, so I've had the benefit, really, I think, of um, you know leading especially two of the great institutions of Malaysia, right? Um, EPF and Kazana. And a lot of the work um, that I put into those organizations really has been standing on the backs of those who came before me, right? So at EPF, you Nathan know, Aslan Zainal, who did a, a fantastic job in terms of really taking uh, EPF down that path of institutionalization, customer service and focus. Uh, I took that journey on um, and then expanded it into digitalization, um, looking at basically the portfolio-driven uh, investments uh, so that essentially you institutionalize the decision-making processes um, in uh, EPF. Kazana, um, again, and I had the fortune of you know, uh, carrying on the good work of, of a good friend, um, Tatsri uh, Aswan Mota, and just taking it to a, a different space in terms of basically thinking about, okay, now that we've established Kazana uh, basically as a Sunwell fund and a name, how do we then institutionalize the decision-making process, take on a lot more elements of risk management into the investment process, how we think about how we deploy the money. And at the same time, you know, the work that's now being carried by Kazana, which is thinking through, for instance, its role as both a sovereign wealth fund um, in terms of you know, advancing the government's requirements um, of local investment, strategic investment, at the same time balancing a commercial portfolio and a need to return a good commercial return on the assets as invested. So a lot of the work, I think, when you talk about institutions, is really about that evolution over time, right? Different leaders will bring a different perspective, but always, I think, being, especially for a good institution to grow, being respectful of what's come before and essentially expanding on that, right? And that's how I think institutions basically grow and uh, establish principles that outlive the people who actually serve them. I think there's no different from Maybank, a great institution, as you mentioned, but also, I think, you know, had been blessed with a strong chain of leadership uh, that's been able to build on what's come from before and expand it as the market and as the environment around them requires. In the 70s, we were a very agriculture-based economy to the 80s, 90s, where we saw industrialization. Thereafter, growth of electronics, services, oil and gas services, and, and now Industry 4.0. As chairman of Exiata and in your previous roles, 
you have insights on the digital ecosystem. And I'd like to get your perspective where you think Malaysia today stands vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN markets like Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam. And where are we on the curve? Are we at an inflection point? Clearly, I think the whole world is moving down a path towards greater digitalization, um, usage of data, and interconnectedness, right? Um, and, and the network effect of having as many people, organizations, services digitally connected and together um, is um, going to be hugely important. Um, so at Exiata, you know, as chairman, uh, I work with management uh, to think through the strategies required, uh, not just in Malaysia, but actually in all the markets that we operate. And the benefit, I think, of an organization like Exiata, we are able to see uh, essentially what's happening in other markets, what's around us. Uh, one of the dangers, of course, is always that if you're too domestically focused, um, you lose sight really of what's happening around you. So, so when I look at what's happening in the markets around us, um, it's quite clear basically that there are great opportunities um, arising uh, in fast-growing economies such as Indonesia, which is structurally poised, I think, uh, to become really a, a fantastic market for investors and for consumers alike. You know, it's the job really of companies like Exiata, even Maybank, people who have a, a footprint in Indonesia, uh, to really think about how we deploy capital effectively to capture really the market that's there and help that market to grow as well. I think, you know, there's always a symbiosis between profit-seeking as a company, actually creating an environment uh, so that your own customers and the services that you offer can actually benefit and thrive uh, in those markets. So when I look at Malaysia's pathway on digitalization, we were a very early leader. If you think about what we tried to do with um, Cyberjaya and introduction of e-government services and stuff like that, my sense basically is that other countries really have caught up with us already. In some ways, maybe are even accelerating ahead. What I think is good about uh, Malaysia is that we have very strong institutions uh, which are providing, I think, the right kind of framework and regulatory framework uh, to allow for a more sustainable growth. The path really is, I think, uh, very, very clear. I think, you know, we have to increase our digitalization efforts. Um, so I think the government also recognizes that. And that's why the push towards having 5G uh, coming in is uh, going to be important. I think 5G provides new opportunities. But the reality basically is that even under the existing 4G environment, we can already connect a lot of Malaysia. The gap now really, I think, is that push towards interconnectedness of data, of uh, basically digital services, um, making it pervasive throughout ordinary life while still maintaining, I think, cybersecurity and also educating the public on how to, you know, both sustainably and securely use um, those services that can be available. So if you look at India, for instance, really made a big leapfrog ahead on digital services and has the benefit as well of having a lot of talent. It's a big country. They can produce a ton of engineers and, you know, uh, software coders every year to the point whereby I think, you know, they can really accelerate uh, their own digital um, ad adoption and environment. Uh, so we need to look at that. I think, you know, the, the main thing I think really holding us back um, is that, you know, we're not really producing enough local talent to actually provide or to do the services and the software writing and everything that we need to do. So we had to overcome that either through outsourcing to other countries which have the talent or um, have a more liberal policy of importing talent into Malaysia. So Singapore has done that. You look at Singapore. Um, you know, they have a very liberal policy about bringing in talent uh, that's required for their digitalization. Uh, and that overcomes any natural shortage of local resources to do so. So we need to think about doing the same as well. We have to accept the fact that we have a limitation in terms of, you know, natural resources in terms of doing this kind of thing. Uh, so we have to overcome that. You have to get past, I think, some phobias around allowing too many expatriate talent into Malaysia. Uh, we actually need that uh, sure. because without that, I think we'll be left uh, pretty far behind. Do you see greater level of convergence um, between industries, you know, telcos, banking, media? Certainly so. I think you're already seeing that, especially in the financial services space. Yes, there have been digital bank each licenses issued and you know, we've been a recipient um, of one of those uh, uh, digital banking licenses. But the reality basically is that most banking services um, have already been transforming into a digital-led online delivery all right, so even you look at uh, Maybank, Maybank probably has the biggest digital bank actually, right? Uh, with Maybank to you and ME and everything else. That convergence is already happening. And it's driven really by the need for the service providers to manage and be more efficient in terms of their service delivery um, and also consumer demand. The consumer wants a more seamless experience. And that's something which when I was running APF as well, you know, we recognized that and we really made a big shift towards digitalization uh, to the extent basically that EPF today probably is the most 
connected financial institution in Malaysia. You know, almost everybody who uses an, an EPF service today is online, whether it's an employer or an employee. Right. Um, so it, actually, if you look at the EPF, it's probably uh, the most connected uh, financial institution um, in Malaysia already. It is said that mindset change is crucial for digital transformation. A lot of patience is needed with upfront investment and results won't come overnight. In your opinion, how do management and boards need to evolve to help more traditional companies navigate this going forward in the future? From my own experience, I think it always helps if the senior management, right, and that's the CEO, the CEO minus one, and at the board level, you have enough people who actually understand the importance of digitalization, who are convinced really on the future on that, and therefore are willing to make the kind of long-term investments necessary to do so. I think boards need to have an honest conversation with shareholders to talk about basically that if you want to future-proof your business, you have to accept maybe some short-term impact from a higher rate of investment um, into providing this kind of platforms and digitization of your own internal services in order to deliver a longer-term sustainable future. Hugely important, right? Because digitalization will also help in terms of managing, for instance, even your carbon footprint. You need to think about, and from an efficiency point of view, will digitalization help you to be more sustainable uh, in terms of how you actually generate your revenue um, and your operational services as well. Organizations which think about digitalization both from a front-end customer perspective and a back-end employees as a customer perspective uh, tend to do well because you then get the buy-in of your employees uh, when they understand basically how digitalization impacts their daily lives and how they do work, how it makes it easier for them. They're then able to translate that into how they then manage their customer base um, and make it easier for their customers as well. The late Harvard professor and innovation guru Clayton Christensen had advocated for large firms to set up separate business units to embark on disruptive innovation. It seems to me that's what Exiata has, has done. How do you look to nurture potential disruptive innovators and ensure that they don't get killed off prematurely? Uh, so there's, there's different ways of doing it, right? I, I think... Organizations or companies which struggle with mass adoption of um, digital culture sometimes tend to use this as a methodology. Set up basically a separate business unit or you know, outside of the chain of command um, that allows them to flourish um, and use that basically as a template that you can then maybe import back into the rest of the organization. It's workable, but uh, I've always believed basically that you actually do need to work a lot on the digital culture and adaptation of your main entity as well. Because otherwise, if you think about it, right, from a revenue needle point of view, right, your new units may not really push the needle that far unless you really put a lot of capital into them. And then you then risk basically bifurcating the organization and having you know, two separate organizations essentially. So it's always, I think, good um, to think about basically how that can help with your main organization's drive towards digitalization. And the reality basically is that sometimes you may need to think about, you know, who are the right leaders to promote in your main organization who are more willing to embrace and change, right? So as the world moves around you, right, and as digitalization becomes an imperative, uh, not just internally, but from your customer base as well, uh, if you don't have the right leaders in place who are willing to embrace it and change the organization, then you really have to think about whether you need to look at changing the leadership, the line managers, to get them to be much more innovative. That is basically a reality, right? Because even if you were to do a separate unit, unless there's willingness in the main organization to adopt what your agile units, whatever else you're doing outside are doing, right, you're always going to have reasons to change. In banking, we often um, talk about how digitalization can drive financial inclusion and uh, by serving the unbanked. How do you see that within the telco industry and, and maybe just zooming straight into what your thoughts are in terms of boost and the strategy that you're looking at for that space? And can digitalization and the broadband infrastructure be as an equalizer? So I think there's, there's ways to think about that as essentially a market that's underserved. Uh, but if you actually look in Malaysia as a whole, as a reality, you know, Malaysia is pretty well banked. We have very good financial institutions, you know, which have done a fairly good job really of reaching out to expanding their customer base, obviously in their own commercial interests uh, to do so. Where is the space really then for uh, digital banking, right? Uh, pure digital banking. Uh, one basically is I think in terms of efficiency of delivery of services, um, turnaround times, um, lower cost of delivering services. 
But there's always a constraint of capital at the end of the day. Banking is not a pure software business, right? Um, in order to make money, you have to lend out money. In order to lend out money, you actually have to have either capital or deposits to do so. So the, the constraint or basically the natural barrier to entry for banking has always been capital and the access to liquidity, right, uh, to do so. The digital banking side of the business can help in terms of both ease of access and a faster turnaround time. And you can think about essentially using the access to data technology to do you know, faster turnarounds of loans as well. So you think about it, right? So whereas your traditional banking loan is measured in months or years, in the digital banking space, you can actually look at loans which are measured in the space of days or weeks. Um, and then you essentially are able to churn your capital more effectively um, so that you are using your limited capital to magnify basically the ability to give out you know, 3x the number of loans that you normally would in the banking environment because in a normal banking environment, your loans are sitting out there much longer. So I think that's where digital banking really will move into for the pure digital bankers. Right? I'm not talking about people like Maybank and CIMB and all the rest who do an extremely good job of, of using digital tools uh, to reach out to their customers. Right? So the digital bank market, I think, will now focus really on that kind of faster turnaround, faster churn of loans, people who need loans for just a day right, or two days right, um, to cover basically their short-term needs. And these are people who don't need a big loan. They may, they may need a loan of maybe 200 ringgit of daily working capital. Um, so that's really, I think, the space that digital banks have to play in because actually given the limited amount of capital you have, there's no point copying the main banks uh, for your traditional housing loan market or car loans or the rest because that's just tying up capital, which we don't really have that much of. Uh, so I think that's really where strategically you'd want to go. And untested, uh, honestly, and, but I think that's where Bank Nagara believes that digital banks should really focus. These guys who would otherwise maybe have turned to an along or turned to basically, you know, um, friends and family for funding facilities. The social protection model, and it's well known that many Malaysians have inadequate savings as highlighted by EPF. Do you have any thoughts on a social protection model such as social insurance pension or universal basic income? How best do we fund this? It's, it's, it's a mathematical game at the end of the day. For you to fund a retirement, uh, those funds essentially have to come from somewhere. Uh, the Malaysian model has always been predicated around two models, right? If you're a public civil servant, it comes out of the public coffers and it's actually taxpayers' money. Um, and that in long term is probably not sustainable. We know basically that if you look at the government's budget, uh, an increasing share of government revenue is really going towards that. For the government, what do you do? You either increase your revenue base and therefore you have to increase taxation if you want to maintain um, emoluments and pension payments to a reasonable percentage um, of your total revenue, right? Or you have, essentially have to start capping uh, basically the public pension scheme, right? Um, on the private sector side, right, it's self-funded and therefore there is no sustainability issue in terms of the system as a whole. But the way it works, essentially, everybody just takes out whatever you put in. And that, what that does show, basically, is that it magnifies the fundamental problem of Malaysia, uh, which is basically we have been too focused for too long on being a low-cost country, right? And therefore, that suppressed wages for the bulk of Malaysians. Um, and what that means, basically, is that government has had to step in to subsidize. So it creates, basically, this counter problem, uh, which is basically in order to have a low-wage economy and a low-income economy in an area where prices inevitably rise through inflation, government has to step in on subsidies. And we're seeing that effect this year. I think the finance minister to Zafar has said basically that um, you know, subsidies have become unsustainable. And they've been unsustainable for a long time. It's just that I think this year has really magnified it when you've seen the inflation uh, flowing through energy prices. You need to do really a systematic reform of the Malaysian economy, right? You need to essentially move wages up um, over time. Uh, you have to make sure it's coupled with productivity gains uh, to ensure basically that you're not creating inflationary pressures. And at the same time, then start to reduce subsidies so that the government has more fiscal space for them to manage their own revenue streams right, and their own balance sheet. As the economy matures as a whole, uh, we can start to think about moving away from this idea of a self-funded retirement uh, towards a more collective principle. But it will require, I think, a fundamental restructuring of the economy first to drive uh, people's salaries up and real incomes up before you can start to do that. It's all tied to talent. It comes back to what I said earlier, right, about digitization, right? So what you're seeing today, basically, is that good talents in Malaysia, understandably, uh, don't really see a great future here and they move out, right? So you see a lot of people moving out to 
regional economies uh, to like Singapore, or traditionally Singapore and Hong Kong. But what you're seeing today as well, uh, basically is the, this reverse, right? Whereby really good talent are moving to take up good positions in places like Indonesia, Thailand, or Philippines, right? Countries that we used to see as low income countries, but actually are paying people better than we are paying. So what's happening is that we are exporting our better talent out at higher wages, and then trying to compensate by importing low paid workers. So it's completely unsustainable. I think the, the economy that we have today is structurally unsound. Right, um, and needs to really be fixed. If I could tap your experience as an asset manager, we saw the US Fed fund rates uh, increasing 75 bips and you know we are in a very inflationary recession environment with geopolitics and protectionism added to the mix. Do you expect that it would be more difficult to generate returns going forward? And where do you see the opportunities in the market, private markets, and also in Malaysia specifically? You know, markets always go through cycles. Uh, I think, you know, those of us who have been in markets long enough know that it's not this crisis, it's some other crisis. Um, so, you know, in the last 20 years, we've had everything from the Asian financial crisis to a dot-com bubble, to the GFC, to the COVID, to this. Um, from a market's point of view, markets are essentially agnostic towards what type of crisis it is. Right? Markets just respond essentially to economic data um, and to financial data. So today, if you look at markets, it's responding effectively to the tightening of the interest rate cycle, uh, to the withdrawal of liquidity uh, from markets, and therefore risk assets are being repriced. So whereas, you know, as a result of the GFC, you had risk assets really taking off due to an excess of liquidity, and therefore people not really measuring properly the amount of risk they're taking uh, for their rewards. Right? Today is very different. Right? Uh, today, the market or investors are pricing cash flow, you know, pricing basically uh, real PNL um, over market share or over basically eyeball share or over used to measure some of this stuff. But again, we've seen this, right? Now, when the dot-com bubble crashed, it was very, very similar. Um, but what I think you'll see basically is that macro structural um, trends are persistent. There is basically a structural trend towards technology, towards digitization, and therefore companies which do well, leaders in those sectors will do well continuously. Yes their market value may come down as a result of revaluations in the market. Right? But fundamentally, those companies will continue to do extremely well. So if you look in the global market, your Googles, your Amazons, your Apples are dominant. They'll continue to be dominant in those spaces because the macro structural trend is in their favor. Valuations may come off because the market now places basically a lot more risk premium uh, on valuations, but that's different. So if you're an investor for the long term, actually there's nothing wrong with continuing to invest along the structural themes, right? Um, technology, urbanization, um, sustainability. If you're prepared to ride out short-term shops to the valuations, then actually you do well in the long term. And you know, there's, a, there's an adage in, in investing that basically if you constantly invest continuously in the right things, then actually you're going to be okay. And that's been a principle for long-term investors like EPF or sure. PNB and all the rest, right? So yes, short-term returns may be poor, but I think long-term uh, returns should still be okay. So having a well-balanced diversified portfolio, um, concentrated in the right structural momentum, I think will continue to do well. You've always been a very eloquent speaker, I must say. And uh, is this a natural talent or were you trained early in life? Or what's your advice for, for those who want to develop their communication skills? Um, I think a lot of it is, is practice. I think um, uh, you know, early in my life, right, I've um, uh, always been... I've never been a, a natural speaker in that sense um, because, you know, I've always been, when I was, especially when I was in my childhood and in my school days, a bit more reserved, a bit more shy. Um, but I think, you know, over time, you know, as you practice um, delivering to an audience um, or and especially in, you know, in a corporate environment, right, uh, delivering to your committees or to your boards, right, uh, you do develop this over time. So uh, the only encouragement I always do is to try and encourage, especially, um, you know, younger team members to take whatever opportunity they have to be able to present. It may not come off smoothly at the start, but you need to build up basically, I think, that confidence to do so. Um, so I'm not naturally an extrovert or a social person, but uh, I am comfortable, I think, uh, now, uh, today, uh, in doing so. But that's true many years of, sure. of doing it. Lastly, you're too young to retire la, from full-time work. So what are your plans? More board positions, more game conventions? What are you up to? What I'm uh, doing today um, is quite good uh, in the sense that basically I'm involved in an industry uh, which is at the forefront of digitalization and communications, going through its own challenges, obviously. right? And that's why I think it's interesting for me to be able to help the board and management to think through strategic ideas um, and positioning of, of what we do. 
Uh, I am still uh, basically uh, finishing off uh, my work at Malaysia Airlines, where I was helping them with the restructuring post-COVID. Um, and that, I think, will be uh, coming off in the next few months. Um, but other than that, you know, I'm, I've been happy to help um, uh, whenever you know, uh, the government asks me to, to provide some advice on key matters. Um, so I'm, I'm working on some things like healthcare reform, uh, financing, you know, uh, stuff like that. Uh, things which I think are both interesting and which has a longer lasting impact on people's lives. Uh, and that's really what, what I'm planning to do with my time. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm really hoping to reserve 30 to 40% of my time uh, focusing on what I like to do, right? Uh, which means, you know, includes traveling, um, uh, gaming, and stuff like that. Actually, and, and this is, I think, something which uh, uh, has become very clear, I think, to a lot of people uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and that's really the fact you know, that life shouldn't be all about work, right? I've been fortunate enough, basically, that, you know, my career is, um, you know, really um, taken off in a, in a very accelerated fashion, right? And therefore, that's allowed me to reach uh, senior leadership positions at a very young age. Um, but what that's also taught me, basically, is that institutions can carry on forever, uh, but human beings can't. And therefore, as a person or as a human, right, uh, you have to think, right, essentially about what your own personal goals are. Um, and if, you're, if your personal goals are too tied in with a position, right, if your sense of self-worth is too tied into being a CEO or whatever, then, then it's very hard to let go. My fear has always been, had always been basically that uh, I wouldn't be able to let go. And that's why I was very clear in my mind, um, even f I guess from my early 40s to mid 40s, that you know, once I'd reached financial independence, um, then actually there was no reason really for me to keep holding on to positions or you know, to keep working full time. Uh, and that's why I've been very clear that um, even at the time when I joined Kazana, uh, I did mention to Tun Made at that time, who was chairman and, and PM. Uh, that I didn't intend to stay on more than the three years, um, you know, do my bit to fix uh, what needed to be done at Kazana, uh, put it on a sound footing, um, and then actually I was going to go off. So I stuck to that plan, um, and I am fully intending to uh, not go back into full-time work. Um, I'm happy to really uh, do what I'm doing today, right? Um, take up interesting positions um, and help management or help boards to think through strategy or think through what needs to be done. But I do intend to spend the rest of my time um, doing the stuff I want to do. Right, as opposed to what my employer wants to do. Cheryl, I hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as I did. Thank you for your insights. Thanks, Hello. Very, very good. Thank you. And that was Tan Sri Sharil Ritza Ritzuan, Chairman of Asiata, speaking to Dr. Fadil Mohamad of Maybank Investment Bank. Follow us for more C-Suite Talks. I'm Noel Lim on ASEAN Speaks by Maybank.